everybody. I'm Larry Roberts. And I'm Sarah Losey, and this is Branded, your comprehensive guide to creative branding. And on this awesome episode of the podcast, I don't know why I'm so stuck on just doing that hardcore radio voice these days. It's so silly, uh, but I love doing it. So uh, today we've got a guest. His name is Chris Weir, and we're going to be talking about uh, creating video. And it's one of my favorite topics. As you know, uh, Sarah and I, we launched Branded Podcast, and we're very video forward, video first. Uh, if you're involved in social media in any way, you know that video is where everybody's going. So Chris is joining us today to give us his insights on how to get started, how to leverage it, and, and even how to go ahead and hit that first time that first time you hit that record button. He's going to help us figure it out. And uh, so we'll go from there. Chris, welcome to the show. Thank you guys so much for having me. I'm really looking forward to this. So you talk about video in the B2B space, right? I do. That is that is uh, all of our clients really are B2B. Okay. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Because I've always personally been confused with B2C and B2B because I feel like no matter what you're talking to people. So how do like, how is that differentiated and where, why is that different with video creation? Yeah. So, I mean, I think the biggest thing is, is the, um, is the purchasing cycle. Like how long does it take to move a lead to become a client? And in B2B, it's just generally longer. Um, so it requires, you know, if it requires 11 or whatever they say, touch points to get someone to buy a product, it might take 20 or 50 touch points to get them to buy a, a B2B service. So it's it's a longer sales cycle. Um, and I think people have to be prepared for that. Um, but also for most small businesses uh, who are service-based, the person themselves is kind of the product. And so using video wisely is kind of a no brainer, but I think a lot of people in that B2B space don't quite know all the time how to do it because, you know, we're entrepreneurs. We are, uh, want, want results as quickly as we possibly can. And it's kind of sometimes challenging to figure out like, all right, how long do I play in this space to figure out what kind of traction do I get um, to decide if I should keep doing this, you know, for a year or for more. So I don't know if that really answered it. Probably made more questions than answers, but maybe something is there. I don't know. It definitely got the curiosity sparked. And that's a carryover reference from our last episode that was all about curiosity. But I'm curious as to like structurally, are there differences when you're creating videos for B2B as compared to B2C? Are you talking about social media esque videos? Are we talking reels, TikTok shorts? Are we talking what are we are we talking educational? Give me a better grasp on on really the primary difference between the the B two B video structure as compared to the B two C video structure. I generally recommend that if you are in the B two B space with video, that the primary place you want to be is LinkedIn uh, because LinkedIn has like the best organic reach next to TikTok and is mostly people doing business with other people doing business. And it's not a ton of, you know, like the types of products and stuff that you're going to see on Instagram and Facebook and, and stuff like that. So definitely want to be on LinkedIn if you're doing B2B video. And then as far as the content goes yes it is it's very different than selling b2c where you're basically making a maybe you'll make like a customer testimonial video or you'll making you know showing off the features of your product or what have you and trying to move that person to sell you know right now whereas in b2b it's a longer education cycle you still only have a few minutes per video to actually educate the person who's watching it so you have to kind of plan out and decide okay what do I need to get them to learn over what amount of time in order to like move that into a conversation? Um, so generally what I recommend is that people pick between one and three areas of focus for their content and breaking that into kind of no like and trust. Um, so the no and the like, just by making videos, if you are yourself, you know, just being yourself and authentic and talking about what you no, um, is going to build that no and like, and then the trust really can kind of come in, in case studies and showing off how you actually provide value to your clients. And depending on the levels of complexity, I tend to say, 
you may not need video for all three of those. Like you might want to do video for your know and like pieces and then build trust maybe with articles and posts that go much deeper into your service. Like if, you know, one of our clients is an industrial engineering consultant. He does a fair amount of content in video form, teaching uh, like Six Sigma practices and stuff like that through videos. But you can also have like a much more in-depth case study in a uh, article as opposed to trying to get that across in two minutes in, in a video. So I, I generally recommend breaking it up into those three categories and then deciding based upon your network and what is actually going to get engagement, how much of each one you want to do. So the no and the like is really thinking about things that like are important to you or interesting to you. Uh, you know, an example might be somebody who is like a realtor, but, uh, you know, crazy sports fan. They might want to make some content just about their local sports team because that's going to be local to their area. Uh, other people who follow that sports team are going to be interested in what you have to say. And then you become the realtor who's also that, you know, sports fanatic in your, in your local town. So it really just depends on um, your content and how you want to break all that up. With being B2B, what if it's like a small business that wants to make the videos, not necessarily one person? How do you recommend they incorporate that human side and make it seem like these videos are people, not a brand? Yeah, I think that that's, it, that's what more companies are doing and trying to figure out how to do is to try and get their team more involved in that content creation. I think you're seeing it on YouTube as well is people in companies are testing out their employees to see like, who's kind of good at this? Like who makes sense to have on camera? And I think a lot of times you don't really know until you've asked your employees to do it. But I think it is, I think it's a very smart move because it educates that no like, and trust kind of can become exponential. Like if you can get your people to be signed off and interested and willing to come on camera and talk about what, they believe about themselves and about their lives and their values and stuff like that. And obviously the company that's huge for building your brand because it really puts not just, you know, you're the owner's face to the company, but like, I know the person who I'm going to be talking about who does, you know, the invoicing or I know the person who's going to, who does the marketing. I know the person who's on the technical side. I know all these people without actually having to have a meeting with them so that when you do have that meeting, all those people show up and it's like, they already know you basically like they've already kind of sold themselves in a lot of ways by getting to know you through your video content. And it's funny, just before I left my, uh, the company that I was at before I started doing this full time, uh, I was launching an internal we'll call it a podcast. Uh, and that was the whole concept behind it. Uh, regretfully it didn't get off the ground before I left, but it, we had spent probably six months, uh, laying the groundwork for doing that exact same thing. So I think that's very effective. Uh, I'm a big proponent of it. Obviously, the company that I worked at, uh, mm -hmm. they weren't as sold, but is an automotive industry. So they move a little bit slower than uh, some other industries when it comes to adopting new technologies. Uh, but I love what you're saying there. I'm curious, going back to LinkedIn, I've heard rumors as of late that LinkedIn is starting to lean more heavily into vertical video. Uh, what is your take on LinkedIn using vertical video as compared to the traditional widescreen format? Yeah, I definitely would recommend doing the the vertical portrait style that you see like on all social media on LinkedIn or doing the square framing that you know is popular on on Instagram. Yeah, when you use the the sixteen by nine framing on on LinkedIn, it just shows up as a much smaller frame. It works, mm -hmm. but it doesn't stand out as much in the feed. So I, I, you know, all the videos that we do are either the, the portrait style or the, the square frames for, for LinkedIn. Love that. Cause I'm, I've been struggling with it myself and I've been posting both. Uh, but I, I do see more engagement with the vertical videos than what I do with the, uh, with the 16 by nine format. So that's, that's very cool there. Yeah. Is LinkedIn also going to have like when you on Instagram, you open one reel and then you just scroll endlessly. Are they going to have that with their video? They do have that now. Do they? Because I, I actually yeah. haven't. I actually haven't um, experienced that because I, I never use it on my phone. I'm always on my laptop because it's like very mm -hmm. regimented. But I knew that they were experimenting with that, so that's interesting that they're they're already implemented it. I noticed that the other day, uh, and it, it's only been well, uh, and it's 
and when this comes out, it'll be about two weeks since we were at a conference. Uh, but there was a LinkedIn panel at this conference, and they told us all kinds of cool stuff. So, of course, I'm all fired up for LinkedIn. And uh, I was watching a video, and then it just served up another video. So I was like, oh, oh uh, cool. So, yeah, you can just sit there and start and, and scroll through videos on LinkedIn as well. I've also tried to kind of not get too close to TikTok as well. We like manage TikTok for a few of our clients, but I'm just like, uh. I just want to. I just want to do do one thing well. I I hear you. It's tough, man, and, and that's why you know I've kind of narrowed things down for me personally uh, to Facebook and LinkedIn. Uh, you know, I have accounts everywhere else, but very rarely do I post on those accounts. Now I waste a lot of time on TikTok. You know, I wake up in the middle of the night and I'm up for three hours because I'm ticking talking there instead of sleeping. But uh, yeah, it's for myself and my content. I really focus on Facebook and LinkedIn. Yeah, it, it, I think it's a good, it's a great place to be. TikTok is kind of like the Gen Z social media. What do you recommend for businesses that have either a Gen Z target audience or businesses that are run by Gen Z? Do you recommend using it? And is there any tips or tricks for doing it well? I honestly probably am not the person to talk to okay. about TikTok. It's just like, yeah, I'm, I'm, in, the, I'm in that Gen X millennial cusp. And um, we did experiment with it a little bit and got, you know, hundreds of views, if not thousands of views on the same videos we got on LinkedIn, but the engagement wasn't the same. And to me, that's generally what I push people towards looking at is like, not just your views, like, yeah, it's great to get a thousand views or 10,000 views. That's awesome. It feels really good. But really what you want to look at, I think on LinkedIn is what are people saying? Like if you have an interesting, an actual interesting take on a particular process or something about your business and the way that you work, are you really getting a legitimate, interesting conversation going? And if you are, that's as important as the views. Because, you know, for most small, medium-sized businesses, they might want a handful of new clients every year three, 10, whatever, something like that, a pretty small number of, of, of actual new sales because maybe they want that to be recurring or ongoing or what have you. So it's, it's a little bit more about creating content that actually gets people in your network talking about something that they actually care about that's also related to your business, hopefully. Uh, and if you can do that, then you can really start to build this trust with your network, which might only be you know a few thousand people and if you can get that in front of a hundred even, and it's the right message, that goes a long way to then building that that relationship over time with them. With LinkedIn, since, since that's your kind of specialty, LinkedIn is known as being the business social media. And it's so it's very kind of polished. We talk about video production and how the trends these days are being a little more raw with video and a lot less produced. Is that the same for LinkedIn or do you have any, is there any difference? It's a really interesting space. Like I've been doing video now for like almost going on 20 years. Um, and the aesthetic has evolved drastically what I generally try and advise people is that you want your content to match your production value. You don't want the production value to outshine the content because if it looks really good and sounds really good, but like what, what they're saying actually is not of high value. We get this kind of eked out feeling where we're like, what is wrong with this? Like, why do they spend so much time and money and effort on this? If like the content is not that great. And if anything, you want that production value to be, you know, maybe even a little bit lower than the, than the, than the product, than the content, because then the, the content is really the star, right? So it's a very delicate balance that you want to find. At the same time, I would say that the bigger the organization, the more that branding really does kind of come into it, where like you want the content to look all similar to some extent and you kind of want it to have a similar feel like when you know you're watching this company's content like you you just automatically feel that this is what it this belongs to this company so generally what we do when we work with a new client is we start their videos off very raw 
And then gradually we kind of add a little bit more elements to their videos so that the production kind of grows as their audience develops. And then we start changing it up. So we say like, okay, we're going to give you like a really, really polished one this week. Now we're going to give you one that's like a little bit more basic that maybe you would see like on, uh, you know, a YouTube short or somewhere else so that you keep that audience kind of engaged and interested in like it's changing, but it all still kind of feels authentic to that person. So I think it's a very interesting place to play. Like there's a lot of room for creativity, but like ultimately the bigger the company, the more you want to think about the brand and like, what does our brand feel like and what does it look like when we, when people see it? Do you, do you leverage a lot of B-roll and like pop-ups and animations and video memes? And do, you, do you integrate those types of things into your videos as well? Yeah, it's, it depends on the client. So some people we do more of that than less. Like obviously like the podcasting clients, like you want to have that B-roll kind of in the first couple of minutes to kind of keep people very engaged and sticking around for the whole episode. For the shorts, we don't do it as much, mostly because the B2B space can be a little dry. I was going to say stale. Yeah, they just Yeah, it's like it's well, a little I'm dry. I'm a talking head and here is what my video is. <laughs> right. Thank you for attending my session. Right. Yeah. And yeah. so you don't want you don't want it to be that stiff, but you do want to acknowledge that like, you know, talking about accounting practices is not exciting. It's not really supposed to be exciting. You want to have some kind of attention getter. You want to have something that brings someone into the content. But then you might have to kind of ramble for a few minutes um, talking about like, let's say like what the new, uh, you know, tax laws are going to be for 2025, right? But the people who, who A, need that information in the B2B space and care about it, if there's value there, they will they will stick through it because you're actually really providing them something as opposed to sort of the rest of a lot of the social media space. You're not just trying to get like eyeballs to get eyeballs. You're like, I want a very niche audience who's actually going to care about this. Like I want realtors who are very interested in the changes to, which there are a lot of changes to uh, real estate practices as far as like the agents and how they're managing properties next year. That's why I want to watch this because maybe I want to serve realtors. So Yes, you want to have enough that like keeps people interested, but I advise not to go like crazy and just trying to get eyeballs because then you kind of you have a mismatch as far as like your you the audience that you actually really want to be getting. See, and I think that's absolutely critical. And you nailed that there is is you know your audience, know who you're creating the content for. And, and and if you understand your audience that is attracted to your brand, then you just create the content that goes right along with that. So, uh, and, and I say that because in my head, well, it's just common sense. Everybody should know that. But it's because I've been doing it for so long that I take for granted that a lot of people overlook what to me seems like a no brainer. Uh, right. and, and, and even at the same time, I still do stupid shit and, and create content that makes no sense for what I'm trying to do. You know, and I look at that and I go, what's the point of that? You know? Uh, and, and, and I don't know, it's a few months back. I created a, uh, an overlay, uh, short that had Alex Ramosi in the background talking about ugly guys benefit a lot from having a beard. So I had Alex behind me and he was we doing his stuff and I'm, and I'm sitting here just stroking my beard and going, <laughs> ah, and it, it, it crushed on, on YouTube shorts. I mean, it's one of my biggest ones on shorts, but what value was that to my brand? None. I just right. told everybody I'm ugly. That's all I did. <laughs> It's a tricky thing. It's an interesting thing. I generally, the advice, because I, I think people like, yeah, a lot of people, especially when they're representing their company, they're like, I don't know where, where to begin. Like, do I just try and get views? Do I talk about all about how I work? I generally tell folks, like, if you care about it, that is all that matters. Mm -hmm. Like, if you care about what you're talking about, that is all that matters. Then people who relate to you are going to want to engage with it. Even if they don't really know what you're talking about, they'll be like, I can feel that this person cares about it. And to some extent, it's like the silly, goofy stuff. Like, if that works for you, if it works for your personality, absolutely do it. Because yeah, it does get views and that can serve as that top of funnel thing, right? That like then sure. brings people to your channel and they go, oh, he also talks about X, Y, Z. So I've definitely done that as well. Like I've turned myself into memes and uh, that always gets a great reaction. It's 
completely ridiculous, but um, people like it. So there's, there's this weird balance of like trying to create stuff that people will like, but it's also like you have to like it. You have to believe in it. And even if it's boring and you get 10 views, but they're the right 10 views and you believe in what you're talking about, I say keep doing it. Yeah. I love that. One of the things we talked about on our last episode was go through going through your own social media and seeing like, would you follow yourself? Right. Yes. Just being brutally honest and be like, would mm-hmm. I? Would I? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, exactly. Are you creating content that you'd want to engage with? Is this interesting to you? Does it right. feel like there's authentic? so much stuff out there? There's so yeah. much stuff to grab you. So it's it's yeah, it's an interesting time to be making stuff. Yeah, it, it, and I, although I was, I started doing this just a few weeks back. Uh, I started um, traditionally on my social media. I would just publish stuff and post stuff like I'm speaking here, I'm speaking there. It was really just an advertising platform for what I have going. But over the last few weeks, I've started writing full blown posts and providing value in those posts, and then attaching a, a an image that relates back to it or a video that relates back to it. And oh my gosh, I've, the engagement has skyrocketed. It's insane. Imagine right. that. <laughs> and some of that probably too is just, it's different, right? Like that's, I think another place that people can get stuck is they're like, oh, I started doing this and it worked and now it's stopped working. It's like, well, it's because people are like such short attention spans. Mm-hmm. Like, oh, well, I've, I've seen it. I've seen his posts like this. I've seen these yeah. kinds of posts from him. So now you have to think of something else. But I think it's like, again, it's like if you come back to that thing of like what interests me, what am I interested in, then you kind of have an unlimited uh, source of content to create. I still don't say exactly what I'm interested in most of the time. I mean, most people that I goes in Batman. Yeah. I mean, if you looked, if I move my camera, I'll, I'm in the bat cave. This is the bat cave and there's bat everything surrounding me. And I have every large scale Batman Lego thing that you can buy on a display table over here. And it's all, but very rarely will you see any kind of bat posts or Lego p- posts. I, I occasionally, when I build something, I may throw one picture up of, oh, I just built this. Ha ha. But I don't talk about it very often because, well, it's kind of embarrassing. I'm 52 and I play with Legos and Batman. And play World of Warcraft. Is it? It's it's, it's (laughs) like to me, it's like that's what like that's what makes you unique, right? And I have an I have a friend who is, you know, uh, he's also my Edward Jones guy, right? And he's the same way. Like he loves playing with Legos, loves like doing like stuff that he's like made his own card games. It's like I think you and him would probably get along pretty well, right? <laughs> and he's like, oh, I need branding work. And you're like, oh, I need like financial advice. Who would you want to work with, him or some other stuff? Yeah. You know, yeah. financial advisor probably. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah, she's got the finance background, so I'd have to work with her. I'd be in trouble. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, then never mind. Never but well, mind. you're yeah, welcome no, to I, send um, him here for branding. Yeah, that'd be great. But I, I'm curious, man, because – you know, I, we both built out our studios and 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 we put a lot of work and effort into this thing, uh, even when it comes down to lighting and cameras and microphones and everything. But you, you, do you need to do that right out of the gate before you start creating content? What, what do you need to get started? I would say for for most people, all you really need is your phone. And generally, when I'm when I'm when I'm telling folks, you know, if they want to get started, my advice to them is like, you just need to get started. Like you can spend so much time Mm -hmm. agonizing over, as you know, the technology and the gear and the setup and the lighting is like, if you can see your face, if there's like light on my face right now and you can hear my voice Mm -hmm. and I have a phone, that is really all you need. And what I generally tell folks is, pick and i picked this up somewhere so i I blatantly stole this from someone but it's so long ago i don't even remember who it was so if you find this on the internet let me know who it is but basically think of um 10 frequently asked questions you get about your business uh the who what where when and why how do you do all this stuff um and then think of 10 questions that you wish you were asked about your business and if you do those two things, where do I sign the contract? That's the only question that I want asked. There you go. <laughs> where do I send the check? Like, yeah. That yeah. is a yeah, funny I... video. 
That is a funny video, right? It's like, I'm going to do a frequently asked questions series. And then you get to my favorite. Then now this is my favorite question that I love to be asked. Where do I sign? And you just show that. And then that's a short video. It's funny, you know? Dude, I'm doing it. Okay. I'm, I'm stealing it right now. It's mine. Do it. I'm doing it. I'm doing it. <laughs> do it. And please tag me. I'm always happy when people tag me. Like, oh, that'd be amazing. Yes. I, I love the fact you said tag me too, because now there's some accountability. Now I have to do it. I would yeah. love that. Yeah. <laughs> We're still waiting on him. He was supposed to do a TikTok dance like episode one. This is episode 72. <laughs> we are still well, I mean waiting. we're all here you could I don't, I don't know if you need to rehearse it or not no no I, I, I'm, I'm good right now I'm just gonna I'm gonna hang out but I'd rather owe you something than cheat you out okay. of it you know I mean okay. that's kind of where I come from you know all right that's fair <laughs> that's fair but yeah I mean okay yeah you said it right there in the, in the episode right just chop chop that out right and that's a short right there yeah you know yeah um but like I, I really do think that's a place to start. And then, you know, record three, four of them, you know, for most people, their businesses, they know them inside and out. They can talk about them all day long, give it a shot, go back and watch them. And if you're somewhat happy with one of them, post it and just see what happens. And for the most part, you're going to get a good reaction, especially on LinkedIn. It takes, it's a little bit of a step out of people's comfort zone uh, and people want to support you. And once you start to put content out, as I'm sure you guys are very aware, you find out what works and what doesn't very quickly. Mm -hmm. And the nice thing about something not working out is that it just doesn't get seen by that many people. If it works, it's going to catch the algorithm and it's going to get promoted and more and more people are going to see it. It's going to be great and it's going to be a big success. If it doesn't, the worst thing that happens is just like nobody noticed it really. And it just got swiped by and no one cares really like they're on to the next thing I, I love that because if you put something out and it only gets two views and you're all embarrassed like oh my god i put it out there i'm so embarrassed only two people watched why are you embarrassed only two people watched exactly it's fine exactly. that's such a great perspective and i've i've never even i've never looked at it that way myself i look at it as oh my god i'm a failure and it didn't work okay Thank God it didn't work. Two people right. saw it. Who gives a shit? Right. Now do something that will work. Oh my right. God. That's another epiphany. This is an yes. awesome episode. And, that's and like, well, go ahead. I was, I was going to say it's part of like people have an obsession with vanity metrics yeah. and people are buying likes and buying followers and they just want people to see like, oh, well, my last post had a hundred thousand likes. It's like, but did it have any impact on right. your business, on your brand, on anything? Right. And, and I, I think we're all in that same boat where it's like you you do a post and it gets a thousand views and you're like, oh my gosh, this is so great. You do the next one and it gets a hundred or 10 and you're like, oh, I lost it. I don't I don't know what I'm, you know, you, you can get, kind of get down about it. But it's like, that's just truth, really. It's like, if nobody saw it, nobody saw it. So it really doesn't matter uh, what it was. And, I think and, my most popular videos have always been of Kevin. So if anyone wants to borrow a three-year-old pit bull, for their videos, it'll crush. I promise. <laughs> I've got a cat here who's yeah more popular than me as well. Everyone loves uh, him. Post a picture of me, and they're just like, just like down here. We we want Kevin. <laughs> yeah, my, my pup down here. I've got a thirteen, maybe fourteen week old old pup oh, down here. Oh dang! I, all I gotta do is post a picture of me and the puppy at the vet, and they're like, oh, oh shit! Like 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 right, like like right. puppies, babies, veterans. Yeah, include no, any of those yeah. and cats. Yeah, cats work too. Look, when I adopted a cat. A stray cat is in my backyard right now at this very second that I adopted, what, two, three months ago? Mm -hmm. And pictures of me and, 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 and Inky. I named her Inky because she's uh. black. And I even bought her a little house. I put a house in the backyard. And I got a, I got a plaque for the house. I call it the Ink Spot because it's where Inky stays. And it, <laughs> people are eating it up, man. I'll get so many likes and engage. Oh, that's so cute. Oh, but they don't know that she's a freaking demon. And well, she's now mean you as hell. The, so the branded branding on the outside of the house too, so then it's double serves purposes. Uh, oh my gosh, bingo! Right there, I put branded <laughs> on one side and red hat on the other, and now I, depending on what side of the house I'm on, that's who I'm creating the content for. <laughs> Well, Chris, man, this is, this is a really fun conversation. I, I I loved it. I love the fact that you uh, took time out of your day to, to, to join us here. Tell people where they can find you and find out more about your business. Oh, and that even spawns a question. So it's Cleaver Creatives, right? 
Cleaver Creative, yes. Uh, the 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 story behind that is both my grandfather and my father were butchers and had a butcher shop in uh, the town where I grew up, Downers Grove, Illinois. And so when I uh, you know got out of college, I started working there, and that's where I made my first movie. And uh, so then when it came to time to to name my company, I was like, that's got some good alliteration. Kind of sounds like clever. It's like uh, it's a nice strong image. Uh, so yeah, so that's that's been the uh, the the company now for almost twelve years, which has been pretty cool. That's amazing. I lo- I love that. And actually, when I was doing my homework before the episode, I was wondering, do you really pronounce it Cleaver or is it clever? Right. Yeah, I was wondering I, that too. I, I didn't know if it was a play on the word. Obviously, I knew right. it wasn't spelled like clever. Uh, but but yeah, so that that's really really cool. And you said something there that sparked my interest. Uh, you made your first movie. Do you do you make uh, independent films or? That is how I got started. So yes, I was like, uh, I was, I'd graduated college and and this was in, oof, this is going to be dating myself. This was back in 2002. Okay. So this was like to do digital video was quite a feat, but basically, yes, I was like, uh, uh, uh enthusiastic about like doing short films and stuff like that. So I, I wrote a film and uh, ended up buying a camera and buying, you know, a Mac G5 for like a ridiculous amount of money back then and yeah. uh, and edited it. And that's how I got into creating video content that led to jobs and, and working and stuff like that. Um, but I still have uh, still have some of those short films out there. I'm not going to promote them here. But, uh, you know, if, if you if, if you DM me for real project work, and then maybe I can allow people to, to see those. Yeah, they are watchable. I said a little independent film bonus. Exactly. Yeah. You get the bonus. Oh, that's the, fun, the, dude. Inside track. Yeah. That's amazing. Right, back in when I was still in corporate, uh, me and my friends, we would make independent films as well. Oh, wow. And uh, there's one, I got to get a copy of it. Uh, I may have a copy somewhere on a hard drive somewhere uh, where we did, um, we entered this, this film competition for this beer company. So you had to make a short film that revolved around the beer itself. And the beer had this really cool ceramic pop top that came off. And it was it was a really cool, I can't even remember the name of the beer. But we did a zombie flick. And the only way to stop the zombies was to give them the beer. And and I was a zombie. And <laughs> we did, we had so much fun with it, dude. We took zombie family photos. We did, I mean, it just, it, you name it, dude. It was it was next level. Uh, we had a lot of fun with that one. So I don't think you've, you've even heard of that story. So that no. Be one there. Yeah. No. I was yeah. like the camera person for a lot of my sister's home movies. And the only one I can remember was the mating, uh, mating habits of grilled cheese sandwiches. And she's going to murder me for saying that out the loud. Eating habits of grilled cheese grilled sandwiches. Cheese sandwiches. They made okay. a, basically made a porno of grilled cheese sandwiches when they wow. were like fourteen. <laughs> Sorry, Em. I I I kind of want to see that film now. I have to say. You, you and me both, Chris. You and me both, brother. It might still so, be on YouTube. I have to find it. She's we'll have to see if we can dig that one up. on TikTok. I don't know why TikTok exists. That seems like it's made for TikTok. Yeah, I'll, I'll find it. I've got all kinds of filthy grilled cheese images in my head right now. So this is, we, we probably ought to close It was live up. action, too. Yeah. Like, oh. <laughs> it was like a, there were like real sandwiches animation. involved. Real, no, no sandwiches were hurt in the making of the film, but real sandwiches were involved. Oh, my gosh. Chris, real quick, tell people where they can find you. Let's get this thing uh, back on track. Yes, you can find me on LinkedIn. You can just search my name, Chris Weir, W-E-I-H-E-R is the spelling. That's the best place to connect with me. You can check out our our, our work on cleavercreates.com. Uh, and uh, I'm always happy to have discussions with people, engage with people on their, on their content, and uh, provide any help that I can. So that was Super awesome. cool. Super cool. Yeah. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Yeah, my pleasure. Thanks for having me. Hey, everybody. If you enjoyed this episode and you got some value out of it and suddenly have a hankering for a grilled cheese sandwich, do us a favor and smash that subscribe button so we can continue to bring you these amazing episodes each and every week. And with that, I'm Larry Roberts. I'm Sarah Losey. We'll talk to you next week. <laughs>